You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. The scripture passage for today is from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 12 and 23 and 24. Lord, you have examined me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. Even from far away, you comprehend my plans. You study my traveling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. There isn't a word on my tongue, Lord, that you don't already know completely. You surround me, front and back. You put your hand on me. That kind of knowledge is too much for me. It's so high above me that I can't reach it. Where could I go to get away from your spirit? Where could I go to escape your presence? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I went down to the grave, you would be there too. If I could fly on the wings of dawn, stopping to rest only on the far side of the ocean, even there your hand would guide me. Even there your strong hand would hold me tight. If I said, the darkness will definitely hide me, the light will become night around me, even then the darkness isn't too dark for you. Nighttime would shine bright as day because darkness is the same as light to you. Examine me, God. Look at my heart. Put me to the test. Know my anxious thoughts. Look to see if there is any idolatrous way in me. Then lead me on the eternal path. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Peak, whether you're here in person or online. My name is Kyle Meyer, and I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here of our congregation. And if you're just joining us for the very first time, here in person or uh, online on a live stream, uh, all summer long, we've been venturing through this sermon series called The Gospel in Disney. It's been this really, really fun sermon series we got to use this summer to sort of examine the parallels between the message of Jesus, the person of Jesus, and the message and the people of Nemo, Olaf, and Kanto, all these wonderful stories that either you as a parent have been trying so hard to remove songs from your heads uh, because you've been listening to them too much, or you were raised on them in faith. And so uh, fear not, we're going to return back to that sermon series next week, but today is actually a really, really special day in the life of our church, and so we're going to pause from that sermon series to welcome our brand new associate pastor, Katie DiStefano. Will you join me in welcoming Katie to our church here this morning? And so part of what we want to do today was use this opportunity on Katie's very first Sunday here to get to know her a little bit, to hear a little bit more of the ways in which God's been at work and moving in her life. What are some things that she brings to our community that we didn't otherwise have before? And so here's how I want to start, Katie. I want to start with just a sort of right out of the gate, a question to get to know a little bit of your faith story and what brought you here to this place. So uh, I'm a firm believer and a firm, uh, I, I very much enjoy the fact that when you go and read the Bible, there are four gospels, four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these four people followed the same Jesus, they observed the same Jesus, and yet if you read their gospels, each of them picked up on different things. They had different sort of things that they wanted to highlight when they were examining Jesus' character his heart, who he was. And so any and every time uh, I meet someone new, I always want to ask their faith story because, quite frankly, there are things that that person has seen and understood and grappled with with the heart and character of God that maybe I know, like, in my mind, 
but I haven't really had like a really, really, really front row seat to. And so we thought it would be an awesome opportunity to start off by just asking you that question of, give us a little bit of background of your faith story. What role faith played in your life? Were you one of those people who was raised in church and came, uh, or someone who came to faith later? Uh, sort of narrate that for us. And the scripture passage for today was not accidental. You chose it. We asked you to pick a passage that really exemplified your spiritual journey, and you chose this one. And so maybe inter intertwined in that answer, you tell us a little bit about what role uh, this scripture um, into your own story and what it means to you. Absolutely. So, hello. Thank you all for the warm welcome already. Um, I actually did not grow up in church at all. Faith was not a value in my home growing up, um, and so I wasn't raised in church. I grew up just down the road in Johnson County. I had lots of friends who were Christians, and I had heard all about this God, I heard about this God who is good and who is loving, but that just didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me because my life growing up was a lot harder than most of my peers. I'll give you the short version now. I'm happy to tell you the long version later. I'm an open book if you want to chat more about it. Um, but it was marked by poverty, hunger, mental illness, isolation. I mean, just you name it. I went through it, and especially being really young, right, I was working through, like, regular pubescent angst, <laughs> and on top of that, like, trying to make sense of, like, why is my life so much worse than all my friends? Like, how could there possibly be a good and loving God if this is the life that I was given? Like, I haven't done anything wrong. I was like, I'm 12. Like, what the heck? But... I was also being sought after by God, even as much as I was trying to push God away and, and just reject God altogether, God was not going to let me run away. And so that's one of the reasons why this passage is really special to me. I wish I could tell you that I like read it when I was a teenager and that changed everything and I became a Christian. That is not the case at all. I actually did not become a Christian until I was in college. But I feel like this Psalm, Psalm 139, really narrates a lot of what my experience was. It's a really beautiful depiction of what we call prevenient grace, that God goes before us and that God is offering us grace before we ever recognize it or even recognize God. And that was true for me, too. I did not want anything to do with God, but God loved me and loves me, let's be real, so much that God was like, no, no, even in this hardship, I am here with you. Love that. I love that. So college is the moment where we start to see faith, like, take root and begin to be something that actually uh, means something actively in your life. And thank you for sharing a little bit of the, uh, again, you gave us the Reader's Digest version, the quick version, but thank you for narrating uh, the different things that prevented you and kept you from faith. I think so often, one of the things that we talk a lot about here in this church is that we want to be, uh, the language we started using a couple years ago is we started using us too language. So we yeah. wanted to be the church that when someone sat down next to you and they were like, bro, I haven't been to church in like a minute because like I've been, my life's a mess and I've been going through this and I've been going through that. We want to be the church that's always like, oh, us too, us too. Like we've been, our family's yeah. been there too or like we as a couple have been there too or I've been there too. So thank you for already embodying that ethic of narrating a little bit of what role uh, those things played in God bringing you closer to you. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that. So you came to faith in, in college, and this started becoming a real part of your life. Mm -hmm. College is where you're trying to figure out uh, what the heck you're going to do with your yeah. life and your identity. I think like, somebody quoted recently that the average college student changes their major four times before they graduate. <laughs> so they're going through this massive identity sort of crisis situation. Uh -huh. But it's also during this time that you not only, faith begins to take hold for you, but you sense a call to ministry, a yeah. call to serve in the local church. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I told you that I did not grow up in church, but I also told you that God was chipping away at my very hard heart even then. So at the same time that I was 
definitely introducing myself to people as an atheist, I also was really curious about church. Like, what are people connecting to? Why are people doing this? So I would go to church with whoever would take me, and I was the person in church who was asking all the questions that made people go, can you ask that? That was me. I was asking those questions. So when I got to college, I was like, okay, I am going to figure this out. <laughs> so I got plugged in with the Methodist church there, and it was like right on campus. Um, and then I tried every campus ministry. <laughs> and like It took me six or eight weeks or something like that into college to even settle on one. And I finally got to UNC Wesley, which happens to be also the Methodist campus ministry. And to this day, I cannot tell you what was different about Wesley. I don't know what the sermon was about. I don't know what songs we sang. I don't know what scripture was read. All I know is I felt this overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit there. I just could feel that that was a place with depth. That was a place that I could bring my whole self, all my pain, all my doubts, right? At this point, I'm not even calling myself a Christian yet. I'm just trying to figure out what Christians are up to. And I, so I went back. I got plugged in there, and I just quickly came to know that good and loving God that I had heard all about. When I got there, I thought I was looking for, like, answers, you know, an intellectual kind of understanding of who God is. What are all the right prayers to pray and things to say about God? And there was some of that, sure, but really what I found was relationship. The way that people at Wesley loved each other and cared for each other and really lived differently because of their faith was what actually opened my heart to who God is and who Christ invites us all to be. So, <laughs> as I opened up there and started to get more involved, everybody there could tell that I was called. They were all recognizing God's presence in my life and my unique gifts for ministry, because spoiler alert, you're all called to. It might not be to be a pastor, but you also have a calling. But people could see right away. And I'm like this little toddler Christian. Like, I just got there. And for some reason, they invited me to lead a small group starting my sophomore year. And I thought they were all off their rockers. But for some reason, I said yes. So trust me when I ask you to lead a small group, just saying. So I started leading a small group, and I fell in love with that, and I continued to lead a small group for the next three years until I graduated. And then junior year's rolling around, and suddenly I'm being invited to be on, like, the student executive leadership team. And again, I was like, what? <laughs> in the meeting with the pastor, when they were, like, offering me this position, I legitimately said, I trust you, so okay, I will do it. I don't know what you see, but okay. And sure enough, now my junior year of undergrad, remember, I've been a Christian for like two years at this point, I am doing what I now know United Methodist elders do, which is ordering the life of the church. I'm like making decisions for the ministry as a whole, and man, I loved it. My particular area that I like oversaw was all about like outreach and how we connect with folks outside of our ministry. So I oversaw our missions team. I oversaw what we called our mercy and justice team. Um, we worked primarily with folks experiencing poverty and homelessness in Chapel Hill. Um, and I also saw evangel oversaw evangelism and outreach to new students, which like, again, why was I in charge of evangelism <laughs> two years into my faith? But I was there and I was doing it and I did it with a smile on my face. And by senior year, I'm now also on the worship planning team. And we're all joking that my real major is Wesley Campus Ministry because that's where I'm spending all my time. And quite frankly, I wouldn't have had it any other way. I loved what I was doing. Everybody knew I was called. I was terrified to say the P word, pastor, out loud. And yeah, I just, I, I loved it. But the thing about my call, discerning my call to ministry, is it actually wasn't in those highs that I discerned it. It was actually when hardship 
came back around. So in the summer of 2019, this is the summer before my senior year of undergrad, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And again, short version of the story, my mom and I had a very strained relationship because of some of the aforementioned hardship of growing up. Again, long version later. Um, and so suddenly, this person that I did not like very much needed me to love her and take care of her. I, I was her caregiver throughout all of this. And I did it, and I was very angry. I didn't want to be doing it most days. Oh my gosh, I'm trying not to cry. Okay. It was a horrible, horrible process. She was in the hospital for five and a half months from diagnosis to death that December of 2019. It is still the worst thing I have ever been through. And somehow, even during that season, I wanted to preach God's love and God's goodness. The very thing I was so sure could not coexist with hardship and suffering as I was growing up was the center that held when my whole life was just swirling and falling apart all around me. And so finally I cracked wide open and I was like, okay, fine. Maybe there is something to this call. So I finally toured Duke Divinity School and Man, I felt that same overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit. I just could feel that that was the place that God was calling me next. So yes, in the middle of my senior year, I applied to a very different graduate program than what I was going to apply to. And I haven't looked back since. I know this is absolutely um, what God has called me to and the gifts that God has given me. Um, and I just, I give thanks to God that we do this whole journey in community and that all these people saw in me what I couldn't see in myself. And now I'm here. Gosh, thank you. Thank you for that. It, I, um, I've got some friends who I went to college with who have stopped going to church. And sometimes they'll reach out to me because when you are the friend, in the friend circle, you're the only pastor. You get, you're the resident uh, answerer of all questions. And I'll never, like, a couple years ago, I started getting a lot of questions from some of my friends, and they're just like, I don't really know, like, I don't really know if I trust church or how to get involved in church and like where where to start. And I think what I loved so much about your story is that um, my advice to them always is something like this: uh, I don't necessarily know if I would run after and fully trust the Christians with all the answers who try to explain away all of your doubts and questions and problems. Instead, I just instead I want to follow the Christians who have been through hell and their faith is still holding. And so thank you for sharing a little bit. Again, there's probably way more you could share, but thank you for sharing a little bit of the, the valley of the shadow of death that you've navigated. And I don't know about you, but those are the only Christians I trust enough to follow. It's the same that we used to talk about this all the time with parenting. Like we used to say all the time we had kids, we were like, I actually don't like talking to the parents who have all the answers. Like, oh, well, let me just give you the sevenfold plan. Like, I hate that so much. I just wanted you to cry with me and yell with me and tell me it's awful and it's going to get better at some point. Like, that's all I actually wanted. Yep. Um, yep. So similarly, thank you for sharing a little bit of that piece of your story, uh, especially for those of us, not if, but when we go through hell, we have someone who can sit with us in it, who's been through it. Um, so I want to ask this question. Uh, so this is a little bit of the backstory. We got a little bit of the backstory of your faith journey and your call story. And I'm so glad uh, that those uh, things have led you here to this place. We are so, so excited to have you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, in, in, in our church, Katie's role will be the associate pastor of adult and youth discipleship. Adult and youth discipleship. So what that means is, if you're an adult and you get involved in small groups and or you want to take Bible studies and classes, we're going to launch a lot of those next month, starting next month. Uh, Katie will be your gal for finding your way there. She'll be teaching some of those as well. And additionally, because she also does youth discipleship, she'll be our youth pastor, uh, shepherding our uh, middle and high school students. And so 
I asked this question at the first service. I want to ask it again. Uh, we've been getting to know each other for the last several months now. As you learn more about this job and this church, what are you most excited about in per, as it pertains to those two realms of ministry? I got to give it to the youth, man. I am so excited to be the youth pastor. I have worked with youth throughout my entire journey of coming to faith and discerning this call. And quite frankly, I just think ministry should have some shenanigans. And I feel like youth is Amen. one of the places where that is best manifest. Now, don't get me wrong, adults, okay? You're not off the hook. The shenanigans are going to spill over into adult discipleship as well. But I, I hold youth near and dear to my heart um, because I just think it's important. Not only It's not only my personality is, you know, joyful and fun, but like actually theologically, I think when we get too focused on having it all figured out, like I thought I was going to when I was new to faith, we miss the joy and the play and God's creativity in, in constantly creating and recreating and recreating. And I think we need to live into more of that. So come to a class or a small group or youth group or something if you would like some more shenanigans in your life. <laughs> so, how about that plug? That's great. This message sponsored by... <laughs> well, and I love that because this is one of the deep, deep values of our church. One of the deep values of our church is that we take very, very seriously the call to not only disciple people now, yep. but disciple the next generation. Yep. Uh, we, this is, I, I beat this drum a lot that the state of the capital C church is in such a place where if we're not thinking long and hard about the church we are now, um, we're not going to have a group or a, a, a group of leaders and teachers to hand the church to next. And I want the peak to be around for hundreds of years. And so um, how we do that is by way of folks with your gifts. And so thank you so much. So, okay, <clears throat> in addition to uh, your identity as a Christian and as a pastor, you're also just a human. So I thought I would throw in some rapid fire, just human questions, okay, to get to know you as a person outside of your role as a pastor. So a couple months ago, we did a sermon series on the Enneagram. The Enneagram is a tool for helping understand your identity and uh, who you are as a person. And so... Without further ado, what Enneagram number are you? And you can explain for folks who are like, this is that weird Enneagram thing popping up again. Describe what it means to be your particular number and how you show up in church circles and such. Yeah. I am so sorry to say, but you have added another Enneagram 3 to your team. <laughs> So us Enneagram 3s, I'm sure you can already tell from knowing Kyle, we are very driven, we are motivated, we are hardworking, we are the people who make sure that stuff gets done and that it gets done well. Um, and so I definitely think that shows up in me. Um, it's been, I mean, a survival tool, let's be real, of some of the hardship of my life. It's been a real gift. Um, but it's also just a joy to share because I just love you all already and believe in you and it matters to me to do things well. So yeah, that's how Enneagram 3 show up. Cool. I swear it's not on the job description. You have to be this number. <laughs> the Lord doth just provide. What so can I say? here we You're are. The best. Okay? So thank you, Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Outside of ministry, what do you do for fun? What are some hobbies and things you get into? Well, if you can't tell already, I'm the extrovert in a room full of extroverts. So anything spending time with people, quality time is my love language, like 12 out of 12 or whatever the scoring system is for the love languages. So anything spending time with people is always my first choice. Um, but most recently, and I am realizing I should have pointed this out in the first service, if you look at that photo on the top, what is that, your right, um, I've gotten into ballroom dancing. So if anybody here is into ballroom or social dancing, Please hit me up. I'm always looking for dance partners. Uh, so that is, that's my joy lately. I love that. I love that. TV show that you're binging right now and or you've binged recently. I just binged The Mindy Project for the first time. My wife's a fan. I feel the ending is very unsatisfying, so we will discuss that later. <laughs> we just finished Ted Lasso last night. And so um, after worship today, there'll be a support group for anyone who's looking for some time just to That's pray what the psalm was and... talking about, about when I go down to the grave, yeah, God is right. there. Finishing the show. That's right. Love it. 
coffee order or tea order? Oh man, it's all confessions this morning. I have to say, I don't actually like coffee or tea. People usually think that's blasphemous. It is. It's because it is. I'm not a caffeine gal. I, I don't like the taste. I don't know. I just drink water. Sorry to be boring. But I will get a hot chocolate if you want to go out for coffee. So hit me up. <laughs> I love that. All right. We'll move on from drink. Favorite food? Pasta. I'm Italian, so I have to say that. But also genuinely love pasta. Okay. And then, like, give us, like, a more refined. So, mm. like, if you're picking a noodle, a sauce-type protein you're going to garnish on top. Oh, it's like ping pong balls in my brain. Like, they're all so good in different ways. But I have to say, like, the nostalgic favorite is, like, my grandma's lasagna. Meat cooked in the sauce. The sauce secret. Let me tell you this. Write this down, but don't tell anyone else. You got to add anchovies to your sauce. Oh, I heard some gasps. We'll talk more about that later, too. There's so much follow-up from this one, okay? We're going to have to all be besties. <laughs> Are you one of those people who, like, writes off Olive Garden because you need, like, genuine situation? Or will you um, do an Olive Garden? You know what? I'm such a people person that if other people are going, I will go. I will just make snide remarks the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I want the real thing. I want the real thing. That's right. Okay, favorite season of the year? Summer. All things warm, water. I'm there. Okay. Favorite, so this is a two-parter. Okay. Favorite place you've been, and then we'll do favorite, or like dream destination. You're like, okay. man, I really have to want to go here. Okay. Favorite place I've been, I was just there, end of May, beginning of June. I was in Nepal visiting a friend, and it was beautiful. It was my first time in Asia, and it is, Nepal was the most chaotic place I have ever been, and also somehow the most, like, peaceful and deeply spiritual place I've ever been. And I feel like that mix is sort of just who I am, and I think that's why I liked it so much. <laughs> cool. Love it. <laughs> Dream and destination, yes. though, is Sicily. My, my family is Sicilian. Um, I've never been, and I would love to go. So if we could just take up an offering yeah, for we're gonna, that. Ushers, or... if you can go ahead and come on up. Uh, we're looking for uh, two tickets. Just kidding. Don't do, tickets. don't do that. Don't do that. Awesome. Love it. Biggest hero in your life? Jesus Christ. Do I get Not an A? Not allowed to give that answer. <laughs> we love you, Lord, but we're gonna we're gonna Sorry. finagle. <laughs> Biggest hero in faith. So mm -hmm. someone whose story you followed, you read things that they wrote, or just shaped you and formed your Christian imagination. Oh man, so many incredible people, but. I'm going to say Oscar Romero is my faith hero. I will not give you a whole history lesson on who that is. If you don't know, you should look him up. He's amazing. But I will say just specifically in this moment as I'm watching the time and thinking about how much more we still have to do, I am so honestly convicted and inspired by Oscar Romero's commitment to standing with victims of systems and structural power and abuse of that power specifically. So Oscar Romero, one of the things of many things he's like famous for is in worship services, not just in service, but like broadcast is on the radio to like read a list of the names of all the people who have been murdered by the government. So I, he then himself was murdered for that, like in church, in a church service. Okay, I'm rambling. I'll tell you more about Oscar Romero later. He is incredible, and I just, I aspire to have that kind of commitment to my faith and to the marginalized, like Jesus himself, who was also murdered for including those who are excluded, so. What I love, um, one of the things I love about Romero is he holds so much of the values of our, that our church was built upon. So we're a United Methodist Church, and one of the values that you'll find in every Methodist church is that we believe that well-balanced faith is acts is built of acts of piety. So that's like going to worship, praying, doing your spiritual stiff, but also acts of mercy, that you actually can't have a whole rounded faith, a well-balanced faith, unless you are doing both of those things. And so great example of that, great example of that. Um, okay, favorite, last, last uh, shenanigan question, and then we're gonna do one more serious question. So, favorite thing to spend money on? I would 
say, and I know this is going to sound really general, but like experiences. So I'm not a big like stuff person. I don't like, you know, to collect a bunch of things. Um, what I would rather spend money on is something that we can do preferably together because quality time. So for example, traveling or dancing or I don't know, going whitewater rafting or like things like that are the things that I really think are worth spending money on because the return on that investment is like the memories and the relationships formed through doing things together. All of that like sounds really good, but I'm going to buy shoes. Like all oh, the time. Oh, you can buy shoes. All definitely. the time. I will respect that. I love shoes. You should see my collection. <laughs> <laughs> Marie, my wife makes fun of me all the time. I'm like, listen, there are so many other addictions that would be far worse True. than shoes. The worst thing I'm doing is just uh, cluttering up the closet. All right, here we go. <laughs> Last question. Last question. And I love this question. Someone asked me this question right before I started my very first Sunday in ministry. I started my very first Sunday in ministry here at the Peak uh, a little over nine years ago. And my mentor, my pastor, asked me this question. He said, I want you to think and pray about what is the one characteristic, one attribute of God that if you don't communicate anything else to the people that you do ministry with, what is one thing you want to make sure everyone you do ministry with knows about God? And I thought that was just such a profound question because it got me thinking about how, that, the, how I answer that question is going to infiltrate everything I do. It's going to infiltrate every sermon I give, every program we organize, every leadership meeting I preside at, all of it, all of it. And so I'm going to turn the table on you. Okay. And if there was one thing that you wanted anyone and everyone during your time here, which we hope is for a very, very long time, <laughs> um, one characteristic or attribute of God that you hope everyone knows by way of your, your leadership, what would that be? I want you to know that God loves you so much. Like more love than you could ever know what to do with. Your cup runneth over with love from God. And that love actually kind of has nothing to do with you. Because it's not something that you earn. It's also not something you could ever lose. It is God's gift freely given to you and you and you and you and everyone in this room and everyone online. God loves you so much no matter what you do or what you don't do or how far away you run, God loves you. God loves you. And so do I. As is. As is. Thank you for listening to the Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.